we will uh, aid you with that. Okay. Oh, with all that being said, we have a special guest with us today, Chris England. Chris, um, Chris is coming to us from Croatia. He is not Croatian, but he has served there many, many years, and he served, aside long, uh, served alongside someone that this church has been supporting for quite a while. If you remember, when we started our capital campaign project, however many years ago, to start raising funds for this facility, we said, you know, it just doesn't feel right for us to raise money for this facility unless we're willing to help another place raise funds for their facility. And so we looked all over the world, and we asked a lot of questions, and everything came back to this little congregation in Croatia that was starting a capital campaign fund to raise their own facility. And so we have been partnering with them ever since. So as we raised money for here, we raised money for there. And uh, they've been very kind to us through the years with uh, giving us updates, and they've come a long way. And, uh, and so Pastor Chris England is with us today to just kind of share a little bit of what's going on. So if you would, please welcome him. Well, thank you, Pastor Tom. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. It's really an honor and privilege for me to be able to take this moment and take these few moments here just to share with you a little bit about what God is doing in Croatia and what God is doing through your partnership with us in Croatia. Uh, but before I go on, I just want to just take a brief moment to say how ironic it is that this church is looking for a drummer and this church has John Bonham attending this church. Now, some of you some of you younger ones may need to ask your parents or grandparents about that, but John Bonham's going to church here, I'm just saying. So, anyway, well, good morning, and just thank you again for the opportunity to share with you what God is doing in Croatia. Uh, this next slide here is just a kind of an overview of, of the downtown part of Croatia, but let's go to this next slide. Pastor Zdenko Jovicic and his wife, Sandra, have been pastoring the church in Split since 2007, I believe. And they have done a really great job pastoring the church. And they asked me, since they knew I was coming to the United States, and they, they couldn't be here at this time themselves, they asked me if I would just come by and share a, a thank you uh, with you all for your partnership with us in the ministry in, in Croatia. He would love to be here. Unfortunately, he can't. But I come to you this morning on behalf of Pastor Zdanko and the church in Split. I just want to share with you a little bit about how God is using your partnership with us in Croatia. This next slide is a picture of uh, three women that have been baptized uh, by Zivanada, or Pastor Zdanko in Zivanada. And in Split, lives are being made new. Uh, this young woman on the left here, we'll call her Rose, was going through a really, really difficult time in her life. And during that difficult time in her life, she started attending English classes that our church was, was offering in, for little to no cost in, in our church facility. And as she was there, she started attending, and she started wondering about what are these Christian books about? Why do you have Bibles? Why do you have a cross on the wall? And she started asking questions, and eventually uh, she built relationships with people, and they introduced her to Jesus Christ, and she became a Christian and was baptized. Rose has a friend. We'll call her Gina. They were meeting one day. They saw each other next, next to their post office boxes, actually, and she started telling her about her, her difficult time, and Rose says, you need to go to church. And so she introduced her to the church, and eventually through the Holy Spirit's work in her life, she came to Christ. Later on, through that relationship, through the, they had another mutual friend. We'll call her Wendy. The three of them, or the two of them, introduced Wendy to Jesus Christ, and she came to Christ. And eventually, I don't have the picture here, but her daughter also came to Christ. So four people came to Christ within a very short period of time through the ministry that God is doing through Jivanada, and you are a part of that. Next slide. Another thing that's taking place in Split is that leaders are being trained up for future ministry. Now, we, 
we have a dream and a vision that this ministry center that is still in the process of being renovated and raised up, we have a dream and a vision that this will be a, a hub, a, a center for training up leaders to spread out through the whole region of Split, Croatia, and the whole Balkan region. But we're not waiting for that to take place. We're starting it now. and We've already seen just this year a group of individuals who've come through and been trained for, to be Christian leaders in Christian ministry, and they've um, completed their coursework and will move on to, to other coursework. So we're praising God for what he's doing. We, we believe that you are a part of this. We see you as partnership, as a partners with us in this ministry. But not only that, on this next slide, progress is being made on the new ministry center in Split. And we couldn't do this without you. We couldn't have purchased this facility without your partnership with us. Your generous and loving spirits, your generous and loving gifts to us are really what we've uh, been blessed with. And we, we are truly blessed with your partnership with us. We couldn't have made the renovations that we've made so far. We can't make the future renovations that we, we're planning to make without your partnership with us. We're not done yet. We hope to be in this new facility by the end of this year. Actually, we need to be in it, frankly, we need to be in it by, by the fall of this year. Um, we've actually already started to move out of, of the space that we're in now. I don't know if Pastor Zdenko told you when he was here or not, but the space that we're in only holds about 40 people. And we've been running in the neighborhood of 80 to 90, 90 people. And, and so we've been out of space in this location for a long time. And so we really need to get in here as soon as possible. But we couldn't do it without you. And so I just want to thank you for your generosity. Thank you for partnering with us. Your generosity is making a difference in Split. And eventually, let's go to this next slide here. This whole area, as you see in this picture, this, this is the city of Split. This whole area, we believe God is going to impact this area because of your partnership with us. And not just this area, but throughout the whole region of Dalmatia and then throughout the Balkans and maybe eventually throughout the world. Thank you again for your love. Thank you for your partnership with us. I'd love to talk to, to, with you more about it later on if, if, if you have other questions, but um, I'll, I'll try to be in the back somewhere at the end of service. Thank you. God bless. If the ushers would come forward, we'll take out the small. Thank you, everyone, worship team. John Bonham. <laughs> you had to go there, huh, Chris? You know, I don't know what's going on over there in Croatia. <laughs> yeah, and believe me, he's never heard that one before, so. <laughs> We can talk about him, though, because he's not here today, so he's between here and Georgia, so it's all right. For nearly six months, or no, actually nine months, most of my messages have run parallel with the outline of the book entitled Believe by Randy Frazee, and actually a, a number of you, I mean, because this is a big book, and, and many of you have been following along with that book. As such, we've examined the Christian faith by way of numerous key beliefs, key practices, and key virtues. Though the sermons were my own with Frazee's gift for compiling relevant Bible passages because that's what probably 85 to 90 percent of that book is, is, is just the Bible. He's taken passages of Scripture and and put them under, um, you know, whatever uh, virtue or belief or practice we've been looking at. He has all these scripture references that, that pertain to that. He has a very, very much a gift for that. And, and because of that, I can say that after 23 years of preaching, probably no other series has helped shape me more than the series we've been working with. In 23 years, now I don't know what you think about the series for last nine months, but for me, it's probably been the most shaping series I've ever been through. But I do have one critique. 
whereas we were challenged over the span of 30 chapters to think, act, and become more like Jesus. In my opinion, we also needed to examine what it is to speak like Jesus, what it is to choose carefully the words we use. So that's what we'll be looking at today. It's my addendum to our series. If you would, please stand with me. Who knows, maybe Randy Frazee will hear the message today and say, you know what, that Tom Parsons is right. I need to, I need to remake that book all over again. I'm going to put a whole other chapter to it. <laughs> Titus chapter 2. Very rarely do you hear something from Titus. Not because it's not good. But it, I mean, it's pretty short. There's three, uh, three chapters in Titus. We're going to go to chapter 2. And I want you to pay attention. In fact, we're going to read the whole chapter. Don't get worried. It's, only, it's, it's 15 verses, okay? But I want to read the whole chapter because throughout this chapter, because the Apostle Paul is writing to Titus, and, and throughout this chapter, um, you note many spots throughout this passage of where we recognize how important it is to choose carefully the words we use. I mean, this applies to all of us, no matter what age, no matter what our profession. It applies to every single one of us. So listen, again, this is Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Paul writes, You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect. Worthy of respect. Respect, friends, remember, is something that you earn. You can get someone to obey you. But to get someone to respect you, you have to earn that. So, worthy of respect, self-controlled and sound in faith and love and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanders or addicted to much wine. <laughs> Don't be drunks. <laughs> that, that's what he's saying, all right? <laughs> but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity seriousness and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to the masters in everything. Now understand, he's not um, condoning slavery, but slavery was very much a, a fact during this time. So he says, you know what? Those of you that are slaves, I've got something to say to you as well. Those that are Christians... And in this particular area of service, as a, a slave, I've got something to say to you. Um, teach slaves to be subject to their masters and, and everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that, and I love this right here, we'll draw from it again, so that in every way, they will make the teaching about God, our Savior. What's that next word? Attractive. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope. And friends, this is you and I right here. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us, purchase us off that slave block, to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself, this is you and I, to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority do not let anyone despise you. Father, we come to you in prayer this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. 
It matters what we say, and it matters how we say it. Lord, as has already been prayed by someone early this morning, may each of us find something in today's message that doesn't speak to the person beside us, it doesn't speak to our child, but it speaks to us. Because it's always easy for us to think about, well, I hope so-and-so is listening to this sermon. Boy, I hope so-and-so heard that point. Boy, they need that one. It's easy to do that. But Lord, today, help us to listen for us. As in, Lord, what do you have to say to me? Or we may not even expect it, but there'll be something in the message that we didn't even see coming. And then we recognize, man, that was from the Lord. He wanted me to hear that. Why? Because it matters. It matters. There's a world out there. They're not only watching us, they're listening to us. It matters. We thank you and give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Being a news junkie, through the years I have kept a running list of some favorite headlines. I want to share some with you. The first one, something went wrong in the jet crash, expert says. And I say, y you think? I mean, I want to get paid whatever that expert probably gets paid, because I can say the jet crashed, there was something wrong with it. Next one, police begin campaign to run down jaywalkers. Police begin campaign. <laughs> Tony Skaggs. I can so see it coming from you, my friend. I don't know where this is at. I have no clue what state. I don't remember anymore the county. But I can tell you this, friends, that if you ever visit this place, you had better obey the signs because the police will run you down. How about this one? If strike isn't settled quickly, it may last a while. <laughs> Next. Cold wave linked to temperatures. Now, I'm sure someone is going to say something of how that has to do with global warming. I don't know. But cold wave linked to temperatures, definitely. The next one, you don't want to go to this place. Red tape holds up new bridges. <laughs> Astronaut takes blame for gas and spacecraft. Well, that stinks. And here's my current favorite. I'm sure it'll be replaced someday. Typhoon rips through cemetery. Hundreds dead. <laughs> it's a real headline. Typhoon rips through cemetery. Hundreds are dead. Wow. Oh, boy. Whether written, spoken, or signed, words are employed at nearly every turn of every day. We all use them, and we use them often. At best, they convey reliable information and guide principled choices. At worst, they provide what we now label as fake news, and they serve as agents of harm. They tear down rather than build up. Either way, friends, words never hold greater bearing than when they are applied spiritually. And such is emphasized by the Apostle Paul in his letter to Titus. Now, it's important, I think, you realize the, um, the connection between Paul and Titus. Paul not only led Titus uh, to receive Christ, but Paul invested a whole bunch of time in Titus to help, um, to help him grow up in the faith, to mature in the faith. And so now, Titus has arrived at a spot that he is mature in the faith, and so he is tasked with reaching others on no less than the island of Crete. Now, here's what you need to know about Crete. At this point, Crete was a place of ultra-low morality, and it's where we get the term Cretan. I don't know if you've ever said it, but like to you little Cretan, okay? That's where it comes from, because this was a bad place, not a good place. 
And this is where Titus is. In many regards, a, a missionary, much like Brother Chris, and he's establishing new congregations. And so with this, Titus was to equip the leaders of these new congregations. He was to equip them with a capacity for teaching sound doctrine. Not teaching twisted doctrine, not teaching a cut and paste kind of doctrine, but teaching sound doctrine, a, a capacity for teaching truth. Thus, these new leaders, their faith was to be genuine. Their faith was to be evidenced by holy conduct, both verbal and nonverbal. So what we find is that these new leaders for these new congregations, um, what we find is that their walk and their talk needed to match up. Their walk and their talk needed to match up, which is where our text comes in. Because while Paul provides specific examples of, of proper Christian behavior, he also cautions against anything that serves as a barrier to making, quote, the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Now, just for a second, I want you to recognize what that says there. You and I are called to live in such a manner. I'm speaking to those of you that say, I am a follower of Christ, I'm a Christian. You and I, fellow Christian, are called to live in such a manner and we are called to speak in such a manner that when others see us or when others hear us, they say, I want what they have. I want to know who they know. That's what should be happening. So we have to ask ourselves, huh, I wonder as people see me, as people hear me, are they thinking that? I want to know who that person knows. I, I want what they have. It happened for me. So many of you know my testimony. I didn't become a Christian until I was at 25. And I've told you a few key people in my life that I watched them. And I listened to them. And I wanted what they had. Oh, I had all sorts of good stuff on the outside. But I was so empty on the inside. And they looked like they were so full on the inside. And I wanted that. And they spoke different than me. And it just sounded better, sounded cleaner. And me, I lived life and spoke in such a manner that it just, uh, and you walk through life and you feel like you just got so much baggage on you. Well, Paul talks about how we need to be careful about these things that can serve as barriers to that right there, to making the teaching about God our Savior attractive. Friends, this lesson is no less vital now than when it was first issued. Given that we're each called to reach others, and we are, Christian, given that we are each called to reach others in the name of Christ, nothing can hinder our efforts more than two specific obstacles involving words. The first one is the sin of vulgarity, because that's what vulgarity is. It's a sin. In your teaching... Show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. While soundness of speech certainly applies to holding a Christ-centered doctrine, it also involves our daily verbal habits. Now, think of yours real quick. What are your daily verbal habits? How do you talk on a daily basis? Because no matter how good the news, and friends, you and I have the best news there is. The best news. But no matter how good the news is, it can easily be marred by what surrounds it. It can become tainted. You can have the best news, but by what you surround it with can just taint it and take away from it, and that's not w what we want. Focusing on vulgarity, and today is a nuts and bolts kind of speech, all right? It's not going to uh, seemingly apply across the board, although I think there's something for every one of us, but it, it, it's a nuts and bolts thing. We've, how we 
learn to think, act, and become more like Jesus. And today we, we ask ourselves, well, how is it that Jesus would speak? And, and we call ourselves followers of Christ. Well, then it, it has to be important to us the way he speaks because that's the way that we want to speak. Now, focusing on vulgarity, Barna Research finds that of those who attend church, now understand, I'm not talking about folks that are sleeping in on Sunday morning. Um, I'm not talking about folks that are, I'm talking about people that are in church, churchgoers. And Barna Research is a, is a, a well-respected group that largely, not entirely, but, but largely focuses on um, um, uh, areas of religion in, in, in various ways. And Barna Research finds that of those who attend church, get this, 37% agree that coarse language is now morally acceptable. Okay, now what that means is that there was a point that four and nearly ten churchgoers, there was a point where they said, well, it wasn't acceptable here at this time, but now to keep up with the times and things have changed, that now four out of ten say that, well, coarse language, yeah, it's, it's morally acceptable. And I wonder what has changed between when it wasn't to when it is. What's changed here? Because I can tell you this, God's word hasn't changed. In my own life, I could think of the first time I ever cursed. In fact, I'm going to tell you the story. I'm not going to tell you the word. That, that is good, Kay. <laughs> Believe me. But I'm going to tell you a story. And as I tell you this story, here's the amazing thing, is that I can remember it. As I tell you this story, I could see it play out in my mind's eye. And, and, and I was thinking about this more this morning as, as I was going over my message. This might be the earliest, <laughs> oh, I hope it's not. This might be the earliest recollection that I have. But I had heard a word that I somehow discerned as being wrong. And I have to be honest, I probably heard that word from my dad. And I'm about the age of five, somewhere in there, hearing this word that I somehow discerned as being wrong. To confirm my suspicion, I marched my little self into the hallway and I screamed that word out at the top of my lungs. Now, you have to understand. You say, well, preacher, why did you scream that word? And I said, well, I screamed the word because in my mind, if I said that word loud enough, I would have said the word and nobody would be able to tell what it was that I said. So I went out to the hallway. I screamed the word. Now, while I have no recollection of what took place immediately after, as I awoke with my mom standing over me, I knew my hypothesis was correct, that some words are not fit to be spoken. Let me say it again. Some words are not fit to be spoken. Yet through the years, I said them all, and I said them all plenty of times. It's still amazing to me, though, that I, I never once that I recall... I never once used the Lord's name in vain. I always found that odd um, because I didn't go to church. I didn't profess Christ. I respected those of you that did go to church um, and had great respect for the church. And, and I always believed in God. Remember, friends, believing up here is entirely different from believing here because even the devil and his minions believe up here. They know that Jesus is real. They got no problems believing in him. But this kind of belief is a receiving. Okay, so even though I had this belief, you know, I, but I never said his, his name in vain, but I've said everything else. And then a miracle occurred. And I mean a miracle. I had a few of them. On that night that I received Christ, remember, this was a, a Saul to Paul conversion for me. A Saul to Paul conversion. On the night that I received Christ, Along with touching my soul, he touched my lips. 
and the filth that once weighed heavy in my language. And many of you have been in the military, and, and you know how it is. I was an every other word guy. I didn't care if I was at a sporting event. I didn't care if I was with the other sergeants or, or, or whatever. If I was back on the block, I could care less. I was an every other word person. And that filth that once weighed heavy in my language, that night that I received Christ, wasn't even thinking about it. But he washed every bit of that away. Never said a word after that. But 37% of churchgoers asked, does it really matter? Well, I want you to consider have you ever heard a professing Christian speak in a manner or tell a joke that sure didn't sound very Jesus-like? Have you ever heard a professing Christian say something that, that seemingly was opposite from that holy message that they had preached to you at some other point? Have you ever read it on their Facebook page? Or, or kids, how about this one? Have you ever heard someone who speaks one way in church, one of your classmates, they speak one way in church, but then when you go to school, you hear them speak an entirely different way. They're not in church. They're not around their parents. The preacher sure isn't there. And you say, man... They talk this way here, but then they talk that way there. And that's kind of how people can be sometimes. Our words changing like a chameleon, depending upon the crowd that we're with. Because it doesn't just happen to kids, because that, that's an easy target. It happens with adults also. We talk one way in church, and then... And then we turn around, we go to work, and I understand some of you work in very, very difficult environments. And I'm not going to lie, I got it easy because I'm in church. You know what? It's amazing. How I will, you know what? I told you every other word before, unless I was around a preacher. It was, it was amazing. I was like a saint, okay? I was like a saint when I spoke when I was around a preacher. And so I admit I have it pretty easy. Some of you work in extremely difficult environments. I'm not going to lie, I have no idea if I went there and you're hearing this and you're hearing that and boom, suddenly you're not even thinking about it and something comes out of your mouth, you're like, what just happened? Understand, much of what's involved in our spiritual growth deals with shedding the pattern of sin. Friends, this goes to all of us. As you and I grow spiritually, which we are supposed to, till the day the Lord calls us home, we ought to be growing spiritually. And that deals with shedding off those patterns of sin and replacing them with patterns of holiness. So I would say, what kind of patterns do, do you have in your life? What are some of the patterns that you say, you know what, that pattern just doesn't belong in my life anymore. I've been used to, go used to going about it this way or, or on this day at this time, I, I've spent my time here. Or I've been hanging around this certain group or, or using these certain words here but not here. What patterns in our life need to be shed because they just don't belong? And we know that. You don't need the preacher to tell you that. And we need to replace them with patterns of righteousness. Well, friends, words do matter. That's the point today for all of us. Words matter. Now, I've shared with you that with me, a big thing was, was not only what I say, but how I say it. You know, and that's where the Lord's been working on me with. But when we get to the very core of it, it's the fact of just the words themselves, because people are listening they listen to what we say, and, and guaranteed, most if not all, s folks are going to know that you were in church today. Somehow, some way, they're going to know that you were in church. And there's going to be people that are listening to you. And does it seem to match up? Words matter. Often I, they either indicate someone with a sound mind and a sound doctrine, or they indicate someone that that James calls double-minded, full of unstable and mixed 
messages. So while society may deem vulgarity to be acceptable, while 37% of churchgoers may deem vulgarity to be acceptable, friends, in order for you and I to make the teaching about God our Savior attractive, in order for you and I to not mix poison into the honey, we need to allow the Lord to touch our lips. Ephesians chapter 5. Among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. But then look what also he puts there on equal footing. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which is out of place. Now, I want us to take a look at this just real quick. I mean, because words matter. It, it's a simple sermon today. It's a nuts and bolts sermon. But I want us to recognize right here that last part. This is God's word. It doesn't change. I know that there are some that say, well, perhaps it used to be this way, but, but now it's this way. And, and I'm one of those zealots. I'm one of those nuts that says, you know what? This word doesn't change. It's absolute truth. Society better change according to this. This does not change according to society. And you and I have to make those choices also. So for those of us that stand upon this, and this can be tough, I know. Okay, for me it was a, a miracle. I call it a, I never said another word after that night that I received Christ. It was a Saul to Paul conversion, and I know it's not that easy for everyone. Don't worry, I've had plenty of things that I've had to work on. It was just the whole language thing that God just touched because he's like, well, I know Tom will mess this up right off the bat. Patow! Okay, just took it from me. <laughs> God can do that, all right? <laughs> but here's what his word says. Nor should there be obscenity. No cursing. None of that nonsense has no place in a Christian's life. Foolish talk or coarse Joking, that joke that, man, I just, oh, it's, but it's a good one. No, it doesn't have any place in your life. Someone's telling it, don't be some nutcase like, whoa, you know, the, just, you've got to hit them over the head with the Bible. Just back away. Just be respectful and just back away. Come here and listen to this joke. You know, Jim, I'm just pulling Jim out, okay? Boop, I just pulled it out of the air, all right? You know, I haven't, uh, blame me. You know, the preacher just talked about that preacher. Ah, oh, I just can't hear that, you know. I, let Use me if you can, all right. Friends, anything less than purity, it only brings confusion to those folks that are seeking truth. As Christians, you and I are to be a people set apart. You and I are to be a people set apart by deed, yes, and by word. We're to be set apart. You ought to sound different from the majority of, of individuals. Ought to be something different about you. Because you're in a lot of places where, er, let's face it, everyone's cursing. Everyone's doing this, everyone's doing that. And then there's you. You know, I don't ever hear Tim say the words that we use. It just dawned on me. I never hear Tim say that. There's something about that guy. And they watch closer. And they listen closer. And God reaches them. Next, there is the sin, because that's what it is, of slander. Teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanders. This is the only other point that we have, all right? The sin of slander. With mature Christian women called to model godly womanhood for the next generation, let me say it again. Those of you ladies who have been Christians for some time, I don't really even care about your age, okay? But those of you that have been Christians for some time, you are called to model godly womanhood for the next generation. There's a group of young ladies that are following up, like my daughters here. I have four daughters. I want them to have many other than their mom. And I know she feels the same way. We want them to have godly examples 
before them of women who are living it out so that this generation, my own flesh and blood, that they can learn from them as well. That's what you ladies are called to do. And so with this, the Apostle Paul says that their success, your success, has much to do with, among other things, has much to do with the avoidance of passing along unfounded, if not vicious, charges. You see, that's exactly what slander is. Slander is passing along unfounded, if not vicious, charges. Now, to be fair, and we're all thinking it, slander is an equal opportunity offense. Okay, meaning that men are just as susceptible. But whether it's in the kitchen or the garage or, yes, online, I, I'm just amazed. Aren't you amazed at some of the nonsense that people say? On? It's like, if you're not in front of folks, you can just type it from the computer screen. <laughs> oh. I don't even have to say it to y'all because you know, right? Oh, my word. There's just so much insanity out there. <laughs> But either way, kitchen, garage, online, as a a Jewish proverb states, I like this one, it says, what you don't see with your eyes, don't witness with your mouth. What you don't see with your eyes, don't witness with your mouth. However, friends, understand, just because you and I may have a firsthand account of something does not automatically mean that we should pass it along. And you know what? I've had to take it on the chin a good few times because I had firsthand accounts of something, of some things, but I didn't stand up here and broadcast it before the congregation. And so you take it on the chin. Same thing with you. You come across things. Just because you know it doesn't mean that it needs to be passed along. We have to have better sense about that. Closely linked to gossip. Slander destroys relationships. Slander ruins reputations. And it prevents the fires of quarreling quarreling from dying down. Friends, slander is a breaker of promises. It is a killer of confidences. And boy, howdy, it is a favored tool of Satan. Satan loves, especially when slander gets to going amongst God's people. Loves it when that happens. God bless you. Welcome. Therefore, as an ounce of prevention, Paul urged Titus to instruct the older women to use their time wisely and their home as a base of personal ministry. Yet for those who disregard such counsel, as Paul explained elsewhere, in fact, it was to a young pastor named Timothy, as he explained elsewhere, if there are those that that fail to pay heed, it says they fall into the habit of being idle, and they go from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying things they ought not to. To men and women alike, to all of us, may we strive to be about the Lord's business (laughs) rather than everybody else's. (laughs) Listen to it again. May we strive to be about the Lord's business rather than everybody else's business. I close with this. Going to sleep each night, listening to AM talk radio, much to the chagrin of my wife. But with that, I'm I'm at the mercy of whomever happens to be on the only station that I can pick up. Now, the only AM station I can pick up is Wowo out of Fort Wayne, all right? Which generally I don't mind, but many years ago, this meant listening to a man named Alan Hunt. Okay, again, many years ago, Alan Hunt, he was a, he was a, a semi-liberal preacher turned radio host, so he wasn't tilted all the way to the left, but, but he was getting close. Now, I was so amazed one night as I, as I listened to his show, I was so amazed by what he was saying that that I had to get out of bed, I had to turn on the light, I had to get a piece of paper and a pen, which are normally close by me in case there are ideas or something, or, and, and I had to begin jotting down some of the things that Alan Hunt was saying. And though he admitted that, 
that he didn't care for profanity and, and excess, because that's what this particular episode or show was about. It was about profanity, okay? And, and so he, she started by saying he didn't really care for it in excess, but he also excused it. This is about nine years ago, all right? Alan Hunt also excused it away by repeating many times how, and, and this is a quote that I took down from him, how God cares more about the intent rather than, or God cares more about the intent than he does the content. So Alan Hunt was saying, I don't really care for profanity and excess, but God cares more about the intent than he does the content. Put another way, and, and you've probably heard this before, God knows our heart, and that's what matters. You've heard it, and I've heard it, and, and quite honestly, we've all probably said it at some point. Well, God knows my heart. Well, now, sometimes that's true, as in God knows your heart, and sometimes it's true as in, yeah, you better believe God knows your heart, okay? So there can be a difference in which direction that goes. Now, on the surface, God knows our heart, that's what matters, or, or Alan Hunt's statement, God cares more about the intent than he does the, the content. On the surface, this sounds entirely accurate, especially when you consider what Jesus said to the woman at the well. He said, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. By all means, this references the intent or the sincerity of one's heart. And if this were all, then I would be in complete agreement with Mr. Alan Hunt. But that's not all. Because the Bible has a lot more things to say when it comes to words. I've already given you some things, but let me give you just a few more examples. Proverbs 15, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. I mentioned that one last week. Next, from Proverbs 16, a wise man's heart guides his mouth and his lips promote instruction. And then this from Job. Does not the ear test words as the tongue tastes food? By these passages and so many more, we recognize that God places high value on both the intent and the content. You see, friends, mated together, they produce the language we speak. A recent post by my wife's uncle, Bern Lytle, he's a retired Wesleyan pastor, um, recent post by his reference Proverbs 13.3. Careful words make for a careful life. Careless talk may ruin everything. And by this, Byrne typed out a, a prayer, which I'd like to serve as today's challenge. Doing the challenge just a little bit different today than I normally do. Here's a challenge, and, and kind of pray it through. I mean, I, I want you to pray it with sincerity. I hope that you can. Uh, I know that I can, because I've told you, I've had a lot of victory in this area. Other areas that I've had, n it's been very difficult. This is an area where, you know, the Lord has really helped me along, but, but you know what? Even I need to hear today's message. The, the challenge, Lord, help me to be careful with my words. Thank you for your spirit who causes me to pause ever so briefly to prayerfully consider whether to release those words from my mouth or not push the send or post key. There's too much ranting and verbal drama already. Shape my words to be healing and encouraging. May they point others to you as the only solution. Friends, if you and I are to become more like Jesus, as important as our thoughts and actions are, so too are our words. May we choose them wisely, knowing they represent the one we proclaim. And that's kind of the point this morning. You know, people are listening. They're watching. And our actions do matter. And it does matter that I'm gentler, you know, and, and, and it does matter that we are, are encouragers. All that matters. But friends, when we get right down to it also, when we get to the very basics, 
the words we use. They matter. People are paying attention. And they're either going to confirm that indeed you are a follower of Christ or early. Because remember, it's easy for me to preach this message in the sense that I had 25 years without Christ. And so I had come across those who professed Christ. And you know what? They spoke every bit like it. I could hear Jesus in, in the way they talked. And it mattered to me. It mattered to me. Those, those few people that I've told you about through life that made a great difference, they all spoke like Jesus. But then I also came across those that were like, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, and da-da-da-da-da, and they talked just like me. They had nothing to offer me, nothing. It could have been vulgarity. It could have been passing along the nastiest trash piece of you got to have you got to have this bit of you know what I didn't know I I didn't need to know that bit of information but it totally contradicted so so as someone with 25 years without Christ I've been able to hear both sides of it let us be a people who speak in such a manner that someone says there's something different about them I want to know who they know Friends, we can be those people. Most, perhaps all of you already are. But there's probably some of us that we say, all right, Lord, help me with these words. Put a, put a hedge of protection around me when I go to work because, Lord, you know when I walk in the factory on that floor, it is hard because everyone's saying everything. You know, some of you are involved in certain fields and it's like, man, it's easy for me to easy for me to talk about how I've had victory in this area if I were in your shoes it may not be a victory speech and so you pray Lord put a hedge of protection around me please help me to speak like Jesus because these people need you Lord and they're not going to find you or it's going to be a barrier if I talk just like they do that's going to serve as a barrier Lord there needs to be something different Friends, as we close this morning, you're more than welcome to use the altar up here. I'd like all of us to turn our speech over to the Lord, turn our words over to Him, all of us. And if you're here this morning and you have never made an intentional choice to follow Jesus, if you're here this morning, I I don't care if you've been here in church all your life or if this is the first time you've ever stepped foot in a church. If you're here this morning, And there's something inside that says, you need to follow Jesus. Then you're in the right place. Because I'll be up at this altar. You come kneel next to me. Put your hand on my shoulder. Because this is the only way that I'm going to bother you if you're up here. You put your hand on my shoulder. I'm going to ask you one question. How can I pray for you? And all you need to tell me is, I want to follow Jesus. I'll lead you in that prayer to receive Christ. Friends, he's got so much more in store for us. His plans for you are good. They're amazing plans. They are not plans of harm. But he wants to use every single one of us to make a difference that matters. Buildings are going to crumble. Money's going to burn. But friends, there is a forever. Let's take as many along with us as what we possibly can. The altar's open if you'd like to use it. Let's listen to what the Lord has to say. Father, we come to you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, 
that you care about us so mightily. I mean, it's just like the parent to the child. The parent cares how the child acts and how the child speaks, and the parent trains that child up in the way they should go and, and how they should go, and you're the perfect father. And so obviously you care about how we talk. You care about the words that we use. And you know, Lord, that these words can, they can be used to tear down or they can be used to build up. They can be used to bring harm or they can be used to bring healing. They can encourage or they can dash the hopes of another. They can point others to Jesus or they can make them run the other direction. Words matter. Lord, we've talked, we've investigated a long while about what it is to think, act, and become more like Jesus. Today, we look at what is it to speak more like Jesus. Lord, I pray for myself and all those that are gathered here today. Touch our lips. Touch our lips. Give us soundness of speech. Not just soundness of doctrine, as important, as vital as it is, but also soundness of speech. When people hear us, may they look your direction. We thank you for loving us, Lord. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday.